Hi students, welcome back. This is part two of the chapter five membranes lecture. Where we left off in part one was learning about uh, something called diffusion, where molecules will move along their concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And remember that this doesn't require any energy in the form of ATP. That's what we call passive transport. Where we're going to start today is learning about another type of passive transport or another type of diffusion called osmosis. So I would say that osmosis is um, a type of diffusion, but it's um, with water molecules. So when we're, we were learning about water molecules, or sorry, when we were learning about osmosis, in part one, pardon me, when we were learning about diffusion in part one, we learned that um, any molecule can diffuse from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Now osmosis is specifically the diffusion of water. I don't know, <clears throat> not only that, but it's the diffusion of water across what we call a selectively permeable membrane. Selectively means only select molecules are going to be able to permeate or pass through the membrane. And in this case, the membrane we're talking about is the cell membrane or one of the mm, membranes of the organelles on the inside. So water will cross a cell membrane. All cells need to have water on the inside to survive. And in fact, they need to have um, a very specific amount of water. It needs to be water balanced between inside the cell and outside the cell. So water will cross the membrane, moving down its concentration gradient. So from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. These two links right here you could um, just type in by hand and watch, but the Amoeba Sisters video on osmosis is um, on our Canvas site as well. So make sure you watch that video and uh, do the worksheet. So let's take a look at how your book represents osmosis. And to me, it's a little bit confusing. So I'm sure for you guys, um, it's even more confusing. What the book has done is given you an example talking about the amount of solute. Solute is what's dissolved in water. So solute could be like salt or sugar dissolved in a solution. And it, it, it boggles my mind a little bit when they're talking about the diffusion of water, when they're talking about osmosis, why are they talking about solutes? That's really confusing for students. And um, I get that they're trying to make a point, but for, um, for all intents and purposes, it, it, it can confuse students. So we are gonna look at the top image last. Let's look at the bottom image, because this is, the bottom image is zoomed in on this area right here. So what they're trying to show you is a pipe or um, just a vessel, right? Uh, something containing water. And this is meant to represent the cell membrane, these gray bars here. And the passageways in between those gray bars are where molecules are gonna pass through. And if we are talking about osmosis, the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane, then you can assume that water is going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So if we were to just count, for instance, the free water molecules, the molecules that are not bound to solute, every one of these little red and gray structures, that's a water molecule. So if we were just to count, we'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and that one will just count as 23. So 23 free water molecules. 
there are water molecules here, but look, they are bound to um, some other, some solute, something that's dissolved in the water. So we can't count those. Now let's look on the other side. Let's count the free water molecules. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven free water molecules. Remember, you can't count the water molecules that are bound to the solute. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's seven water molecules over here on the right side. So knowing what you know about diffusion, you could predict that the water is going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And that direction then will be this direction from left to right through that membrane that's the direction that water is naturally gonna want to flow. You've got 23 water molecules here, seven water molecules on the right side. So those water molecules are gonna pass right through that membrane along their concentration gradient until they reach equilibrium. So uh, eventually there would be like 15 water molecules on the left side, 15 water molecules on the right. Let's go back up to the picture on top. So what they're showing you is, and this is why it's confusing, they're showing you solute molecules. Uh, so each one of these purple balls is something dissolved in water. That's what a solute is. So um, this could be, we'll just say it's salt again, right? So let's say we've got one, two, three, four, five, six salt molecules on one side. And that's, remember a solute is something dissolved in water. So if there are six um, solute molecules, let's just say there are 94 water molecules for a hunt, for, for a hundred, for counting, for, <laughs> counting for 100 total molecules on the left side. Now, if we go over to the right side, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 salt molecules. And in an equal solution, then that would mean there would be 88 water molecules. So when we're talking about osmosis, we really want to know, uh, or we really want to focus on water moving across the membrane. Most solutes are gonna be too big to pass into the cell, at least via diffusion. They might go through another way, but we're really focusing on water here. So I, um, this is why I kind of think it's confusing for the, um, the book to talk about solutes um, when we really should be focusing on the water. But if you count it out, lay it out like I did, you can very easily see that the left side of the pipe has a greater concentration of water than does the right side of the pipe. So water is going to want to move down its concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And so water will move from left to right. And that's why you see the water level here going down and the water level over here going up. Look what the authors have done. And they're showing you that the, the um, solutes, salt in my example, they have not passed across the membrane. Look, we still got one, two, three, four, five, six. Same as we did over here. So solutes are not passing through. And on the right side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Oh, they screwed up, or else I screwed up. Uh, <laughs> Thirteen molecules of solute, right? Let's see, did I screw up? One, two, three. Oh, I screwed up. I can't count. We'll just change this to 12. So solute molecules wouldn't be passing through. So they're trying to show you here in this picture on the right side that it wasn't the solute that passed through that membrane. It was the water. And that's why the water level rose over on the right. Okay, so why is this important with regards to the cell? Water balance between cells and their surrounding um, environment is absolutely crucial for survival of those cells. Remember that cells don't exist in, they can't exist in a, in a, in a completely dry 
uh, environment, most cells, they are submerged in some sort of fluid. All the cells in your body are uh, submerged or surrounded in some sort of fluid, right? They're not dry on the outside. So cells, living cells need to um, find a balance between the amount of water inside and the amount of water on the outside. So tonicity, this term right here, that's a term that describes the ability of a solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water. Gaining too much water, bad news. That's gonna cause the cell to potentially explode or uh, the cell membrane will rupture. Or if the cell loses too much water, that's an issue as well. The cell's gonna shrink and it loses the water that um, it needs for all of those hydrolysis reactions, all those chemical reactions that occur inside of the cell. So um, let's look at some uh, vocabulary words here and then I'm gonna go over a, um, an example with you. So an isotonic solution, iso means same or equal. The concentration of solute is the same on both sides and the cell volume does not change. So we're talking about the solution. When we're talking about tonicity, we're always talking about a solution, not the cell, the solution. So an isotonic solution has the same amount of solutes on both sides and therefore has the same amount of water on both sides. That will not cause a, uh, the cell volume to change. You won't have a whole lot of water rushing in. You won't have a whole lot of water rushing out. This is the ideal, right? This is really what cells would like to achieve, this homeostasis. Uh, a solution that's hypotonic, this is where the solute concentration is lower outside of the cell. And if the solute concentration is lower outside of the cell, then there must be more water. So if there's more water outside the cell than inside the cell, those water molecules are going to rush into the cell and the cell at the very least is going to expand and may burst. Think about watering your plants. You go up on a hot day, you go up to your deck or you go out to your front porch and you see that your plants are um, starting to shrivel up. And that's an indication that the cells on the inside have lost a lot of water. So what you do, you, you go out and you uh, get your watering can, you fill that up, you fill up your, or you, you water your plants and not too much longer or not many, uh, you can almost see it uh, within minutes the water is gonna rush into the plant cells and cause the plant cells to expand. And that's what kind of perks up your plants. That's what gets rid of the shriveling. Um, and then a hypertonic solution. This is where the solute concentration is higher outside the cell. So if, there's, if the solute concentration is higher outside, that means there's a less water in that solution and more water inside the cell. So in this case, water molecules are gonna move out of the cell and the cell will shrink. And I'll show you an example of this here in just a second. I've got my own example that I drew for you. This is what the book tells you, or shows you rather. Um, this is a red blood cell. We'll just abbreviate that RBC. All of these are RBCs, red blood cells. So if you were to place a red blood cell in a hypotonic solution, the uh, what's gonna happen to the, the cell is water is gonna rush into the cell and that's gonna cause the cell to expand. If you were to put a red blood cell into a hypertonic solution, what's going to happen is the water is going to rush out of the cell and that will cause the cell to shrink. Both of these cases are dangerous to the cell. We can't have the cell gain too much water and potentially uh, rupture. We can't have it lose too much. So ideally, we want um, 
our, our cells or living organisms need to have their cells in an isotonic solution where you have the same amount of water on both sides. So therefore you get no net loss or gain of water inside of the cell. So um, let's go ahead and example here that I drew out for you. Okay, so let's, let's have a look and the, let me see what color should I use? The green circle is a cell. And it's really similar to the picture you just saw, but here I'm using numbers to help you uh, understand uh, a little bit better. And then the um, little, the yellow container here is, I don't know, like a beaker that you might use in a lab. Remember that when we're talking about osmosis, we're talking about the um, movement of water, not the movement of solutes. And so let's see if we can determine what's going to happen to the cell by looking at the amount of water on the outside of the cell and the amount of water inside of the cell. So if we look just at water, in the fluid, in the solution outside the cell, there's 60% water. And within the cell, there's 30% water. Which direction, based on what you know about osmosis, which direction does water want to move? Into the cell or out of the cell? So in this case, water is going to want to move into the cell. And that will cause the, the cell to swell, right? Let's move to the next one. Here you've got 50% water in the solution, and in the cell, you've got 50% water. So which direction does water want to move? It's in equal concentrations on both sides of that cell membrane. In this case, you get no net movement. You might have a few water molecules that pass from the cell to the solution and from the solution back into the cell, but uh, generally there's no net movement, overall movement of water. And then lastly, let's look here. We've got 90% water on the inside, 20% water on the outside. So the direction that um, water is gonna wanna move, it's gonna wanna move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So water is gonna leave the cell. In this case, the cell will shrink if it loses water, right? So that helps you kind of to envision um, osmosis and why it's important for cells to maintain a water balance. Let's um, go back now and let's name the solutions based on the terms that we just used. So let me see, I'll get a different, I'll use yellow. So let's look at the concentration of the solution. Here you've got 40% sodium chloride, we could just call that salt water, right? And you've got 70% on the inside of the cell. So if we're talking about the solution itself, right, let's do this. So that fluid that the cell is immersed in, um, if we were to name that, we would say that this solution is hypotonic. Let me get the red pen out. This is a hypotonic solution. Hypo means low. And so we call it a hypotonic solution because there is less solute, less sodium chloride on the outside than there is on the inside. There is a greater concentration. And here we've got in the middle, we've got the same amount of salt on either side. So um, same oops. isotonic means same. So this would be an isotonic solution. 
And then if we move over all the way to the right, we've got a solution in the, in the beaker that's 80% sodium chloride and inside the cell, 10%. So um, the solution has a higher um, solute concentration than does the cell. And the prefix, the Latin prefix that means higher or above, is hyper. So we call that solution hyper tonic. Okay, so let's move on to the next topic. We're still learning about diffusion. We've learned so far that diffusion is the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, and that that does not require energy. We've learned about osmosis, which is a special case of diffusion. Osmosis, remember, is the movement of water molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Now we're going to move on to another type of... Ooh, pardon me. We're going to move on to another type of diffusion called facilitated diffusion. And in facilitated diffusion... There's still no energy required and molecules are going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, but they can't pass directly through the phospholipid bilayer. They have to pass through specific what we call transport proteins. Remember in the first part of the lecture we learned about those proteins that are embedded in the membrane? And what you're seeing here on the, in the bottom picture is this is one of those transport proteins that is creating an open channel. This would be like an open door into a stadium where uh, each one of these little uh, yellow balls is a person. And they're in higher concentration outside the stadium than they are inside the stadium. And they're just going to walk right through that open door along their concentration gradient. So no energy is required, but not all molecules can pass through this transport protein. This transport protein is very specific and it's only going to let certain molecules through. So just kind of in general, when we're talking about membranes, not necessarily the, the, um, the protein channels, but the, mo the molecules that can pass easily through a cell membrane are going to be small and polar, or they're going to be non-polar. They can easily diffuse across a membrane. They don't require transport proteins. Large polar molecules or charged ions, like let's say magnesium is a charged ion, and other very large molecules do not easily cross the cell membrane. So it's these substances that need the help of transport proteins. It's those substances that don't normally uh, pass through the phospholipid bilayer. They can't pass through the membrane here. They've got to use these protein channels. And those protein channels are going to be specific to the molecule itself. So, um, for instance, look here. Um, let's look at this example. This is just another way to look at that membrane and, and visually show you what can pass through and what cannot pass through easily. So we've got inside the cell, outside the cell, and then this is the phospholipid bilayer, right? So that's that cell membrane. And if we look, um, small nonpolar, pardon me, nonpolar, not small, but nonpolar molecules, things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrogen, some steroids, they can easily wiggle right through, they can easily wiggle right through the phospholipid bilayer, no problem. Small uncharged polar molecules, polar, right? So polar molecules can pass through, but they have to be really small. So uh, things like water, uh, glycerol, urea, which is um, a nitrogenous product, and ethanol, alcohol, right? 
that can wiggle right on through. But what can't pass through that membrane are large molecules that are uncharged and polar, things like glucose and sucrose, these two sugars, too big, they are going to require a transport protein. So they can't wiggle through that phospholipid bilayer. There would have to be, in order for those substances to pass through, there would have to be some sort of um, membrane protein here that will allow those substances to pass into the cell. And then ions as well. Uh, most charged particles are going to kind of be reflected right off that membrane. They too would require a uh, protein channel in order to um, pass into the cell. If we go back here, remember um, I said that water can pass through that membrane. That is true, but there are also protein channels embedded in the membrane that help water pass through faster because water is so important. So we've just looked at the um, molecules that are able to pass through the membrane and molecules that cannot pass through the membrane, those that require proteins to assist them. So the way in which the proteins embedded in the membrane function can vary, and some uh, proteins function uh, by becoming these um, tunnels or passages uh, for ions or other molecules. And so that's what I was saying before. Sometimes they act like an open door into a stadium. They're open all the time, and only those specific substances can pass through that open door in the stadium. But what other proteins can do is bind to or create a bond to the molecule. The protein will change its shape and allow or push that molecule into the cell. And this is more like a turnstile at a stadium or a revolving door. You have to walk into the uh, revolving door um, and push on that turnstile and the turnstile or the revolving door turns to the left and you pop out the other side. So that turnstile is kind of like the protein. It changes or it uh, moves, it changes its shape a little bit and uh, propels you out on the other side. And so that's kind of what happens with these molecules is that they bind to the protein. The protein changes its shape and shifts and moves that molecule into the cell. In both cases, like I've said before, the protein is specific for what it's moving in, specific for the substrate, right? Uh, specific to what the thing it binds to. And um, these substrates can be things like sugars. Those are very large. Amino acids are large. Ions uh, are not necessarily large, but they're charged, so they don't pass through easy. And then there are special channels for water. Even though water can pass through the membrane on its own, uh, cells often have specialized uh, proteins just for water so that water can pass into the cell more quickly. So keep in mind to the um, inner workings of that cell. So let's have a look. So um, like I mentioned, water is, is polar and it does diffuse through the membrane via osmosis, but it goes very slow. So there are specialized channels embedded in the proteins. These are called aquaporins. This is a specialized protein. That's the name of the protein, aquaporin. And that allows for very rapid diffusion of water into and out of, not all cells, but certain cells. Okay, so those are the ways in which molecules move through the membrane without energy. No energy is required. No ATP is required. The next type of uh, transport we're going to learn about is active transport. Active transport requires energy. The cell must use energy. And that energy comes in the form of a molecule called ATP. Remember, all cells require 
uh, the use of ATP as a source of energy. They can't use um, like the carbohydrates that you ingest directly. They can't use the proteins that you ingest directly. They turn those uh, carbohydrates and proteins, for instance, that you would ingest into a different molecule called ATP. And that's the source of fuel or the energy that um, moves all cellular reactions, all things happening inside the cell. And if we think about it, um, when we're talking about active transport, what active transport will do is it will move a solute against its concentration gradient. So it allows the cell to move molecules against a, um, a flowing river, for example, or against a waterfall. Remember that we learned that molecules naturally want to move to an area of high concentration. We'll put a membrane here. Right? They naturally want to move to an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. But what active transport does is it's going to pump these molecules against that gradient. Right? So in the opposite direction that diffusion would normally show. So let's move to this series of stages for active transport. This is a nice little gram or, or, or process that your book shows you. So let's look at what's here. You've got the, uh, the membrane, which is here, right? And there's this transport protein, that purple structure. And you've got a lower concentration of solutes inside of the cell than you do on the outside. Look, you've got f four molecules outside the cell, two on the inside. But your cell would really like to move these two solute molecules out of the cell in this direction. But what really, what the molecules want to do, they want to move from an area of high concentration on the outside to an area of low concentration on the inside. So what will happen is these two molecules, in order to get these two molecules outside the cell, some ATP is required. So if we go to the next picture here, remember that um, these proteins are specific for the substance they're going to move. And uh, the solute molecules, look, they've, they're, um, they bind to the transport protein. That requires energy. Don't worry about this stuff yet. We'll learn about that later. But that requires a little bit of energy. And look, look what's happened to the transport protein. It's changed its shape. And what it's done is it's dumped those two solute molecules on the outside of the cell. So rather than having four molecules on the outside, for instance, you now have six and uh, none on the inside, zero on the inside. So the protein has changed shape, we're bound its passenger and has uh, expelled energy, those solute molecules. And then what happens at the end of this reaction is that transport protein goes back to its original shape so that it can do its job again. So this is a type of um, active transport. All active transport, oops, sorry. Now let's look at um, two ways in which the cell, or two terms rather, when we're referring to what the cell is moving. If the cell is moving um, things outside, from inside to outside, that's called exocytosis. And if the cell is moving things from outside to inside, that's called endocytosis. So these are the two mechanisms that move large molecules across a membrane. Exocytosis, exo, think of like exit, right? Um, exports large molecules like proteins or polysaccharides outside of the cell from inside the cell to outside. Endocytosis is used to bring in, endo means in or within, is used to import substances uh, useful to the cell, but that would normally be too big to pass through the membrane. In both cases, the material that's transported is packaged within a little vesicle that fuses with the membrane. 
So let me show you rather than just speaking that. Let's look at, um, this is endocytosis. This is an example of endocytosis. And more specifically, it's a type of endocytosis called phagocytosis. And that's the um, where a cell takes in a large particle. And it does that by wrapping part of its membrane around the particle it wants to take in. There, um, I'll use, I'll use red again. I'll use red again down here. So here is the particle that the cell would like to take in. And it's going to take parts of its cell membrane, these little projections of its cell membrane, and kind of wrap its cell membrane around the, um, around the food particle. And then it brings that food particle inside the cell. And that food particle is wrapped in a part of the cell membrane. It's wrapped in a phospholipid bilayer. And that's what we call a vesicle. So that's what phagocytosis does. And then some enzymes inside the cell will ultimately break down that phospholipid bilayer, right? And then eventually be able to break down the components of that large food particle. But imagine you couldn't have this large food particle passing directly through that phospho phospholipid bilayer. It would just be way too large. So this um, is a type of kind of wrapping its, its membrane around a food car particle and pulling it in and then temporarily keeping that food particle um, enclosed in this little vesicle. Here they're calling it a food vacuole. A vesicle is just a generic term for like a little encapsulated structure. Another form of endocytosis is what we call pinocytosis. And this is the same thing as with phagocytosis, but it's taking in uh, fluids rather than um, solid particles. Pino means to drink, and cytosis uh, refers to something that the cell does. So this is literally translates into cell drinking. And here again, you see the particles that the cell would like to take in, and those particles get uh, wrapped up in the membrane, and then that um, part of the membrane kind of pinches off, and then creates this little vesicle on the inside of the cell with it, the fluids on the inside of it. And then lastly, um, there's a type of endocytosis that we call receptor-mediated endocytosis. In this, in this case, there are receptors um, in the membrane that interact with a very specific protein. So let's look at, um, I'll use blue. So here is the receptor, this little Y-shaped structure, right? That's the receptor. And you see how it's specific to what it wants to take in? See this little triangle shape? That fits this triangular molecule perfect. So remember that relationship between structure and function, right? So there are um, receptors embedded in the membrane that are specific to um, a specific um, molecule. And when those molecules bind to the receptors, that causes the, um, the uh, membrane to indent here, like you see, and eventually it will pinch off and then uh, create a vesicle on the inside. So that is the very last slide. This is the last lecture for Chapter 5, Membranes. See you next time when we uh, learn about the organelles inside of the cell.